Hey there guys, this is your host Richard with another marvellous video. George Miller's post-apocalyptic Australian outback set in the Mad Max franchise can easily be considered as an epic about the kind of doom we can expect if modern civilization were to ever fail. In this world, everything is dangerous. I mean, even your body is a danger, because if sandstorms don't take it down, dehydration surely will. But this fictional hellscape thrives upon the concept of power struggle, and because everything in the wasteland is endangered or extinct, through its characters we see the portrayal of Darwinism at its finest. The the rule here is pretty simple. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. If you're not always on your guard, you either get turned into a sausage, a slave, or a living blood bag. While the background of the films have always been harsh and unforgiving, what's even scarier is the rise of absolutely batshit crazy megalomaniacs this setting has allowed. Since 1979, the Mad Max saga has maintained its first-rate cult status, as each film has introduced its eccentric share of legendary one-of-a-kind villains, and to be honest, Miller is only pushing the mark forward for his demented villains with each new release. The ones reigning at the top of this unforgiving food chain are at the top for a reason, and let's just say, this deplorable dryland helps them thrive because here, there are no laws to stop them from literally anything. So, here are our picks of impressionable villains in the franchise that'll indeed make your blood curdle. Without wasting another moment, let's get right into it. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Mad Max, 1979, Toll Cutter. The first iconic villain of the Mad Max franchise was played by Hugh Keith Byrne, the same person who played Immortan Joe in Fury Road. To counter its amazing, morally great protagonist, George Miller introduced a ruthless antagonist who would drop your jaws with his cruelty. Even though he doesn't do so much damage as compared to the other villains in the franchise, Toll Cutter is surely the reason behind Max Rokotansky's morbid character development from a I joke when I'm stressed approach to the more emotionally stoic vegetable that we see today. If you've seen the film, I doubt you have no wonder why. Tolkott had earned his notorious reputation and respect from his wild biker gang, even if he looks like someone who would easily fit into my chemical romance. Whatever it might be, dude is absolutely deranged, and is said to be one of the first few after the fall who didn't waste time to revert back to his animal instincts right after the concept of societal laws vanished and human resources began running low. Tolkott led a bike gang named the Acolytes and is first seen in the film while they're wreaking havoc on a town, vandalizing property, stealing fuel, and terrorizing people. He was apparently looking for a fallen gang member named the Knight Rider, and reacted pretty rashly when a train conductor called the Knight Rider a poor bastard. However, he quickly calmed down and ordered his cronies to take the conductor away without hurting him. Soon after, Tollcutter and his gang chase a couple fleeing in the car, and once he catches up to them, his gang first destroys the car and then rapes the unfortunate couple. Later on, Max Rokotansky's partner Jim Goose is ambushed by Tollcutter and his protege Johnny the Boy, who were waiting for him to show up. After Johnny leads Goose to crash the pickup truck, Tollcutter makes him throw in a lit match into the petrol leaking from the wreck, thus igniting it and severely burning the helpless cop alive. After seeing the condition of his partner, who was barely breathing, Max was completely taken aback and immediately decided to flee with his wife Jessie and the baby son, Sprug. While on their trip, Max stopped at a roadside garage to fix a flat tire while Jessie and Sprug decided to get some ice cream. There, they were met by Tollcutter's gang, who tried to harass Jessie and somehow, after escaping that, Max and his family hid in a remote farm owned by an old friend named May. But Tollcutter's gang learned of the location from the garage mechanic and followed them. When Jessie's ambushed by the gang after a beach trip, May found them off with a shotgun, and she, Jesse, and Sprog escape in a van. However, the van broke down on the road, forcing Jesse to flee on foot with a son. Tragically, they were run down by the gang on their motorcycles just as Max arrived, too late to save them. Sadly, with Sprog killed instantly and Jesse at a near death mark, Max was brimming with rage. He then puts on his police leathers and takes the supercharged Black Pursuit special from the MFP garage to hunt down the gang. After torturing the auto mechanic for information and forcing several gang members off a bridge at high speed, Max methodically tracked down the gang's leaders. He shot Bobby Zanetti at point-blank range with a shotgun, despite being seriously injured himself. While Johnny managed to escape after seeing Bobby get killed, an angry Tollcutter also tried to flee on his motorcycle. As Max followed him closely in his desperate escape, Tollcutter veered into the path of an oncoming semi-trailer truck and was instantly killed. Overall, as the main villain of the first Mad Max film, Tollcutter was a mean, cruel, greedy, violent, ruthless, sarcastic, and aggressive leader, capable of both savagery and strategy. While not as calculating as Bobby Zanetti, Tollcutter still had a tactical mind when dealing with situations. He was easily angry at people's lack of finesse and was always more eager to carry out his revenge in a more subtle and psychological manner. Even then, Tollcutter did show a semblance of a conscience when dealing with others. This is evident when he dismissed the train manager by signalling his gang not to harm him. See you later, Goose. It's been a pleasure. 
Johnny the Boy. Johnny was Tolkutter's protege and actually committed many heinous crimes, including rape and multiple cold-blooded murders. When Max and his partner Jim Goose arrested Johnny for participating in a gang rape and beating a woman's boyfriend nearly to death, the victims were too afraid to testify, which forced Johnny to be bailed out. Later, while seeking revenge, Johnny sabotaged Goose's bike with Tolkutter's help, causing Goose to crash the next day while riding at a high speed. He was later forced by Tolkutter to brutally finish Goose off by throwing a lit match at the leaking fuel, resulting in a fiery death for the patrol officer. Johnny was eventually hunted down by Max and handcuffed to the wreckage of a car. He then set up a death trap by telling Johnny he could either cut through his handcuffs within 10 minutes or cut through his own ankle in 5. As Max drove away, the car eventually exploded, blowing Johnny to pieces. Just out of the style. Bubba Zanetti. Tollcutter's second in command. Bubba Zanetti was actually a calculative jackass. In the film, we saw Bubba and his gang absolutely devastate a small town by vandalizing its property, stealing the fuel, terrorizing the residents, and even killing people. Bubba hated the fact that Tollcutter made him play babysitter for Johnny. The fact that he was quiet and serious made him more intimidating than anyone else. Bubba also preferred using ranged weapons and was the one to shoot Max in the knee, even though he generally avoided participating in the gang's melee violence. However, he did run over Max's arm after shooting him, causing him severe injuries that forced Max to wear a leg brace in Mad Max 2 and beyond. When Max Rokotansky goes on a revenge quest after the brutal murder of his young son and wife, he confronts Bubba Zanetti. While Bubba believed Max was incapacitated, the latter actually killed him with a sawn-off shotgun before Bubba could try to run him over again. The Knight Rider. Crawford Montezano was a rather important member of Tolkutter's gang and was more popularly known as the Knight Rider. We don't know much about his imprisonment, but Mad Max directly opens with the end of Knight Rider's story. He apparently escaped police custody in Sun City with a punk woman named Marmaduke by his side and attempted to run away from the main force patrol in a stolen MFP pursuit special. As he drove, Knight Rider recited a Muhammad Ali-style rhyme over the police CB band, proudly gloating his heroics to his friends and flexing his generic invincibility. After escaping his initial pursuers, the Knight Rider crossed paths with the leather-donning Max Rokotansky, the MFP's top pursuit man. Max was the better driver with a faster vehicle, so naturally he chased the Knight Rider down in a brain-racking car chase. But the Knight Rider tried to play a dangerous game of chicken, assuming Max would swerve first. Well, this backfired when he lost his nerve and the Knight Rider swerved off course. Now almost weeping in fear, he finally realized his impending doom. Max then swiftly shunted Knight Rider's Monaro along the highway at full speed, and barely being able to focus on the road, Knight Rider failed to do anything about the overturned vehicle in his path thus leading to a fatal crash that killed both him and his girl. Later, Tollcutter retrieved the Knight Rider's body in a small coffin from a remote outback town station, and let's just say that's pretty much how the film began. Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior, 1981. Lord, humongous. If you didn't know, Mad Max 2 was what pinned Miller's franchise on the map and paved its way to become the successful world it is today. But the major highlight of The Road Warrior was its out-of-the-box mad crazy villain, Lord Humongous. If you just watch the film, you'll basically see a psychopath with a military background, who likely suffered severe burns or injuries from an accident or explosion and wore a mask to cover it up. It's just assumed that sometime between the gap of Mad Max and Mad Max 2, Humongous rose to power and led a gang of marauders bikers, berserkers, and generally psychotic people. But his group shared one widely exhibited aspect, and that was androgyny. With that being said, Lord Humongous commanded his otherwise unruly faction through fear and violence, as they roamed about on an indefinite campaign, looking to steal necessary resources and killing anyone who tried to stop them. Given that their fleet stood on assorted vehicles, their main focus was always acquiring more petrol. So, when they got to know about a working oil refinery, Humongous didn't think twice before planning to take over the pump and extract all the petrol they could take along. But unlike his ruthless followers, who wanted to forcefully take control of the compound by roguely storming in, Lord Humongous tried a different approach. He spoke with eloquence and reason, almost requesting the compound's inhabitants to surrender peacefully. He even promised them safety in exchange for compliance. But the ones who refused to peacefully surrender or were captured while escaping had to face inexplicable torture and death. However, when two people from the compound still defied these threats and attempted to escape, their actions managed to draw the attention of our hero, Max Rokotansky, who was then trying to survive as a drifter in a post-apocalyptic world. Well, this is what ultimately led to the inevitable downfall of the great Lord Humongous, as Max decided to become their messiah and help the compound
compounders make it out alive with their valuable tanker of petrol. During the final chase, Lord Humongous personally took down Papagello with his spear. He even kept shooting the tanker while Max was driving, but when the gyro pilot temporarily incapacitated him, Humongous activated a nitrous booster in an attempt to catch up to Max, the tanker, and the caravan. However, he was oblivious of the fact that Max had turned the tanker around and was heading in the opposite direction. This ultimately led to a fatal head-on collision between Humongous and Max, thus killing both Humongous and Wes, who were standing upon the hood of the tanker. Wes, Lord Humongous's lieutenant and second in command. Wes was a mohawk leather clad biker who led groups of warrior bikers in various battles. Known as the most brutal of Humongous's followers, Wes was a psychotic brute who was cruel and relentless in his manner of chasing a prey. Basically, dude was an animal, but despite his vicious nature, he had a soft spot for his companion, the Golden Youth, and was deeply distraught by his death. In The Road Warrior, Wes first appears during the film's opening chase, where he and several marauders go after Max. Although Max somehow avoids any attacks coming his way, Wes gets hit by friendly fire, but seems to be completely unfazed and simply pulls the arrow out of his arm to continue riding away. Later, Wes is seen harassing the people at an oil refinery, trying to break in. But after his companion, the Golden Youth, is killed by the Feral Kid, Wes becomes even more enraged and is hell-bent on capturing the refinery, to a point where Humongous had to literally restrain him with chains. He's finally unleashed when the Marauders chase the tanker truck driven by Max. Even though Wes tried to climb onto the hood of the truck, he was ultimately killed when Humongous rammed the tanker head-on. Lord Humongous's Marauders. As you must have figured out, the Marauders were brought together by Lord Humongous, who set his sights on a compound with plenty of oil in order to seize all the gasoline to fuel their army of vehicles. When the two of the compound's inhabitants tried to escape, Max decided to play hero and help the residents of the refinery by teaming up with a few brave volunteers. Their plan was to fool the Marauders into thinking they were escaping with the refinery's gas, thus diverting the attackers away from the real escape plan. After Humongous and his lieutenant were killed, with their leaders dead, the remaining Marauders gave up the fight, scattered, and fled. I think every character within this gang was equally distinct, from the clothes to the presentation, and of course the unhinged bloodlust. They really don't make them like this anymore. Mad Max 3, Beyond Thunderdome, 1985, Auntie Entity. So, Auntie Entity said that before the pox eclipse, she was a nobody. But the day after the world fell, she had the chance to become somebody because unlike many, she survived. This idea captures the essence of the Mad Max universe as a whole, because all these wild characters who were once ordinary citizens literally reinvented themselves to survive the hellish world they now faced. You could even argue that unhinged tyrants like Humongous, Dementus, Immortan Joe, and Auntie Entity were always like this, and the apocalyptic circumstances only allowed them the opportunity opportunity to thrive. Anyways, after the fall of civilization, Auntie Entity became powerful enough to establish Barter Town as a permanent trading settlement. She fortified it and imposed a harsh form of law and order on its residents and traders. As she told Max, Auntie Entity stopped at nothing to defend the semblance of civilization that she'd managed to create while the world was dying. To this end, a cunning auntie even manipulated Mad Max into a gladiatorial battle known as the Thunderdome against the champion Blaster, with the hopes that Max would kill Blaster. Basically, she was using Max as the convenient means to carry out a political assassination without disrupting the fragile illusion of lawful order that kept Barter Town from descending into absolute chaos. But when Max defeats Blaster in combat, he refuses to kill him after discovering that Blaster has Down Syndrome. Of course, Auntie Entity was furious to not get away and had Blaster executed to uphold the rule which stated that only one man could leave the Thunderdome alive. She then invoked the harsh ritual of Buster Deal, face the wheel on Max. When Max spinned the wheel, it landed on Gulag, and just like that, he was exiled to the harsh desert where his chances of survival were looking pretty pretty slim. Luckily, Max was rescued from a near-death state by a group of children who were living in a hidden oasis valley beyond the wilderness of the desert. As he recovered, Max learned about their Peter Pan-esque cult-like belief in Tomorrow Moraland, which is apparently a mythical paradise based on their fragmented memories of civilization. But still, Max explained to these kids that such a place once existed but was now destroyed by the apocalypse. He warned them that if they ever left their secluded paradise, the first thing they'd encounter is the treacherous Barter Town, assuming that the desert doesn't claim them before. Despite his warning, a small group group of children decide to leave anyway. And of course, given his savior complex, Max had no choice but to follow them. He catches up to these kids just when a large sinkhole in the sand dunes was about to swallow them. And even if he managed to pull some of them out, Max lost at least one child. They had no choice but to continue their journey, and once they reached near Barter Town, they began looking for Master, only to find that Auntie Entity had reduced him to a slave. Of course, Max and the children somehow managed to free him, but in this process, the guards were alerted, ultimately leading to a frantic chase. Auntie Entity sent her elite drivers to pursue Max and the children, 
who were escaping with Master and a modified truck on the train tracks. But in the chaos, Bartertown's methane factory got damaged and exploded. Eventually, Max and his group managed to ride the rail line until it ended near the hideout of the pilot who attacked Max earlier. When Max convinced the pilot to help them escape in his airplane, he realized there wasn't enough runway for takeoff with all the weight. So, with the attackers closing in, Max took a truck and smashed through a roadblock, finally allowing the children to escape. At the end, we see Auntie Entity confront Max, but something changes in her. She seems to realize the tyrant this harsh world had turned her into and somehow empathizes with Max. Despite being surrounded by her guards, Max earns her respect, and she lets him live after acknowledging their strange connection. As for Auntie Entity's civilization and her former position of power, it's left unknown at the end of the story, but I have a feeling that she went on to rebuild Barter Town with just intentions. Overall, as compared to the other main villains of the franchise, Auntie Entity really stood out a bit for her diva-like appearance in a post-apocalyptic wasteland, but of course there's a reason for that. Initially, Auntie Entity wasn't a bad person because her goal of creating Barter Town and eventually restoring civilization was indeed for the greater good. At least, that's what she believed, but despite offering this hope to many, she also became a tyrant. One thing's for sure, no matter what face she put up, Auntie Entity really wanted to restore humanity, but the only issue was that she continued to act based on what she thought was right and regularly kept executing people she saw as threats to her vision of society. Iron Barbassi. Iron Barbassi served as Auntie's right hand man, helping her govern the settlement of Barter Town and carrying out her orders, which included helping her dispense justice. He was also the head of Barter Town security and played a role in bringing Max to Auntie's watchtower. He was also involved in putting Max through some audition to assess his readiness to confront Blaster. Later, Iron Bar advised Master and Blaster to obey the law when Max confronted them. However, when Max defeated Blaster and refused to take his life after finding out he suffered from Down syndrome, Auntie ordered Iron Bar to kill him. Later on, Einbar demanded that Master fix something in the underworld, but when Master refused, Einbar threw him into a pool of pigs. Auntie intervened, instructing Einbar to make use of the Master instead of killing him. When the Master is brought back up, she orders him to comply with Einbar's orders. Despite his size, Einbar proves to be a dangerous enemy for Max and the other heroes. We later see him engage in a fight with Max and the heroes when they eventually come to rescue the Master. Throughout the movie, we see Einbar Bassi wearing a doll's head on his back and harbor a growing hatred toward Max Rokotansky. He miraculously survived several close calls, but ultimately met his end when Max drove into him to create an escape route for the other guys. You probably last remember him as the funny guy who definitely gave the middle finger to the heroes as they ran away. You pedestrian! Drive on! Master Blaster As you might have understood by now, Master Blaster, the main villain, is actually a duo consisting of Master, the brains behind their operations, and Blaster, the muscle. Their symbiotic relationship helped them complement each other's strengths and weaknesses while enabling them to survive and even flourish in this harsh world as they managed Barter Town's energy needs. Master Blaster brought a unique balance of strength and cleverness, unlike any other villain in the franchise. While their secondary antagonist compared to Auntie Entity's powerful rule, they surely stood out as some of the best villains in the Mad Max series. So, Master saw himself is the real leader of Barter Town, sometimes even making Auntie Entity admit this over the loudspeaker. He went on to impose embargoes that ended up causing problems for Barter Town by cutting off its power supply. When Max was sent to observe Master and Blaster in the underworld, he discovered that Blaster was highly sensitive to a high-pitched whistle he'd found in the wasteland. This knowledge later helped Max gain an advantage when he challenged Blaster to a fight in the Thunderdome. Naturally, like I've mentioned before, Max defeated Blaster in combat, only to discover that Blaster had a childlike mind. So, when Master intervened to protect him and threatened to cut off Barter Town's power, it resulted in Blaster's execution. Master ended up being imprisoned in the pig pens below Barter Town. However, by the end, Master was freed by Max and escaped from Auntie Entity's forces on a train stolen from Underworld, later joining Savannah Nix and her tribe that left to settle in the old ruins of Sydney. Mad Max Fury Road 2015 This iconic film rightly filled a 30-year gap in the franchise with its iconic villains and power-packed action sequences. I mean, there was never a dull moment in Fury Road, and I doubt anyone will ever get as good as Miller does with his villains, because with Fury Road, he gave us the pure form of evil on Earth. Given that Furiosa also featured many of the same popular faces, we'll collectively discuss the roles in both the films together. So, let's start strong with... Joe. 
As far as tyrants go, Mad Max franchise's Immortan Joe is easily one of the most intense villains in cinematic history. Before his post-apocalyptic rise to power and before he became Immortan Joe, this guy was a rogue military officer named Colonel Joe Moore. The only thing he did differently than others was he seized a gaping hole of power that rose with the worldwide conflagration to elevate himself into a godlike supremacy. This guy's backstory gave us a glimpse of just how easily the line between civilization and barbarism can blur out. Joe's eventual establishment of order in the chaotic wasteland wasn't driven by noble intentions, but by his own selfish desire for power and control. Colonel Joe was a key figure in the tumultuous times before the apocalypse and had access to all the critical resources, weaponry and manpower. These assets gave him a significant edge in the harsh, lawless environment that Australia became in the Mad Max universe. So, by using his ruthless and strategic mind, the Colonel leveraged these advantages to transform himself into a despot ruling the wasteland with an iron fist. At the beginning, he formed a biker gang that terrorized the survivors after the fall of civilization. His gang included ruthless henchmen and cunning strategists. With every Every battle, the gang grew stronger by killing the leaders of other groups and capturing their women. Eventually, his vision of restoring society quickly took a darker turn. As time went by, he and his gang ventured into the wasteland, where they discovered a massive aquifer plant, which would later come to be known as the Citadel. It wasn't very long before Joe and his biker gang took over Bullet Farm, Gas Town, and eventually the Citadel. In this sense, the Colonel seized an opportunity that most people wouldn't even notice, let alone take advantage of. Joe's military experience and his clear lack of concern for human life actually enabled him to create a new social order centered entirely around his own power. As a result, the Colonel became more than just a leader. He became a figure of immortality in the eyes of his followers. Amidst all the dying world, any remaining hint of humanity in Colonel Joe Moore vanished quickly as he became a ruthless and calculating monster. Returning humanity to its most primitive state eventually led him to create the Citadel as his stronghold in Fury Road, and ultimately led him to attain a godlike status among his followers. The brutal reality of that world made it immensely difficult for the survivors to distinguish fact from legend. People began to worship Joe like a god as he transformed the aquifer into the three towers of the citadel and further searched the wasteland for more resources. As he molded the wasteland to his own will, Fury Road made it very clear that for Joe, immortality became more than just a title, it became an obsession. As you know, the king is always at the top, and Immortan Joe became the king of Citadel. He lived in the main tower of the citadel, which he called his headquarters. At the very top of it was the Biodome, where the five wives were kept guarded. It was unarguably the most luxurious part of the complex, far beyond what the average wasteland dweller could imagine. Despite his totalitarian rule, Joe somehow had an altruistic nature as he believed he was benefiting the society within the Citadel by correctly rationing the water supplies, growing and distributing crops, using enslaved human beings as living blood bags for his war boys, and implementing a breeding program to ensure a successor that would carry on the legacy of his vision. Even though he deeply cared for his wives, Immortan Joe treated them more like his own property, as he often called them his treasures. At one point, Joe believed that his wives were unappreciative of what he considered generosity. Apparently, living as imprisoned sex slaves was the best life they could have in the desolate world after the fall. But according to him, these girls didn't appreciate this freedom and had grown to become spoiled brats who dare to rebel against his authority. Even then, he cared about the women who carried his children and made sure to not do anything that had put their life at risk. This also became Joe's noose at the end because he simply couldn't let Furiosa escape with his fives. At the end of Mad Max Fury Road, Immortan Joe chased Max, Furiosa and his wives across the wasteland. During this intense chase, Furiosa, despite being heavily injured, somehow managed to climb onto Immortan Joe's vehicle and lodged a harpoon into Joe's mouth. As the chain connected to the harpoon was caught between the wheels of the Giga Horse, it exerted a tremendous amount of force, ripping off Immortan Joe's jaw, throat, and nose, resulting in his instant death. People Eater. Shortly after Max joined Furiosa and the wives in escaping from Immortan Joe, the People Eater appeared in the film to lead an army from Gastown. He was there mainly to keep track of the expenses involved in the mission. As a calculating and administrative head, he often stayed in the background, complaining with the bullet farmer about the effort being invested into rescuing a small group of women who they viewed as easily replaceable. When Joe's convoy got stuck in the bugs, the People Eater was one of the few who dared to speak up to Joe, expressing his frustration over the wastage of petrol and vehicles. Despite his disdain for Joe's actions, he still acknowledged the value of the wives and advised the bullet farmer to avoid harming them, given that Joe saw them as valuable assets. After taking a break in the shade for a while, the People Eater quickly joined the chase back to the Citadel as they pursued the war rig. During the chaotic chase, Valkyrie was knocked off her bike by one of the war boys' cars. Despite avoiding being run over by Immortan Joe, she tried to assassinate him, but her attempt failed because of the bulletproof glass on Joe's windscreen. Seeing this, the People Eater took control of the wheel and deliberately swerved into Valkyrie's path, crushing her under the tanker's weight. In the chaos of the chase, 
The People Eater's tanker finally caught up with the war rig, only to be disrupted by Slit's reckless attack on the vehicle. This resulted in Slit's car crashing into the side of the tanker, resulting in a huge explosion that set the rear of the tanker on fire. Oblivious to the danger, the People Eater spotted Max hanging from the war rig and instructed the driver to run him over. Just as it seemed, Max was about to be hit. Nix pushed Max to safety, and he landed on the front of the People Eater's vehicle. After taking control of the driving wheel by knocking out the driver and steering the vehicle, Max knocked the People Eater unconscious in the process. But as the tanker aligned with Immortan Joe's Giga Horse, the People Eater regained consciousness and tried to shoot Max. However, Max grabbed the gun and broke the People Eater's fingers. In a panic, he tried to escape through the sunroof but was pulled back and used as a human shield when Joe opened fired at Max. The People Eater took multiple bullets to the chest and one in the eye, which killed him instantly. As the fire burned in the tanker's rear, Max steered the vehicle close to the war rig and then used the People Eater's weight to press down on the accelerator before leaping into the war rig. Shortly after, the tanker exploded, engulfing the People Eater's gigantic body and causing a huge fireball that engulfed much of Joe's convoy. Bullet Farmer The Bullet Farmer, who was formerly known by his military rank and surname, Major Kalashnikov, is an old ally and comrade of Immortan Joe and led the faction known as the Bullet Farmers. Before the fall, Major Kalashnikov was a professional soldier and officer in the Australian Army, serving under Colonel Joe Moore during the Oil and Water Wars. But after the chaos broke out in the cities, Kalashnikov eventually became Moore's right-hand man in a gang of ex-soldiers. Heavily armed and well-equipped, they moved further inland, raiding and pillaging resources from survivors. Eventually, they discovered the Artesian water source that would later become the Citadel. After their fierce battle to acquire Citadel, in the end, only Colonel Joe and Major Kalashnikov survived from their small assault team, ultimately defeating the enemy forces. That's how Joe tasked Major Kalashnikov with restoring and commanding an abandoned lead mine at the west of the Citadel. It was actually Major Kalashnikov who took the abandoned mine and transformed it into a facility to produce small arms, gunpowder, and ammunition, making him the judge, jury, and executioner of the bullet farm. Throughout his life, the bullet farmer was obsessed with firearms and practically felt incomplete without a gun. He'd even replaced some of his teeth with bullets and literally wore clothing made of ammunition pouches. During the events of Fury Road, the bullet farmer joined Immortan Joe in the chase after his escaped wives. When Joe's infant son died, he led a night raid on the war rig to capture Joe's remaining four wives. Later, the bullet farmer lost his eyesight when Furiosa shot out his vehicle's spotlight, which caused the hot glass shards to pierce his eyes and blind him. Despite this, he kept going in a rage, calling himself names like the Scales of Justice and the Conductor of the Choir of Death, shooting wildly at the war rig and his people. But Max eventually took him down destroying his vehicle and bringing back his bandoliers as proof of his death. Rictus Erectus As one of Immortan Joe's imperfect sons, Rictus was an enormous man, nearly seven feet tall with a large muscular build and a shaved bald head. Like his father, he needed clean air to breathe and used an apparatus on his back made from engine air filters that was connected to a nasal cannula. Ironically, Rictus's armor was covered with baby doll heads of various sizes instead of the usual Immortan Joe logo seen on Joe's other forces. These baby heads were also seen on the bumper of Rictus's vehicle, which possibly reflected his childlike nature, because after all, Rictus was a child stuck in a beast's body. Despite his immense physical strength, Rictus had cognitive disabilities, with his social behavior resembling that of a prepubescent boy. So, unlike his brother Corpus, who was physically weak but intellectually strong, Rictus was intellectually weak but physically powerful. In the comics, Rictus was first seen while the organic mechanic was conducting a health checkup on the five wives. Upon finding out that they were ovulating, Rictus tried to lunge himself at one of them but was quickly stopped by Immortan Joe, who threw him out of the biodome. Apparently, apart from Furiosa, nobody could stand up to Rictus, which is why Joe had appointed her as a bodyguard to protect his precious wives. During the events of Furiosa, he acted as a henchman for Joe and was seen to be rather vocal, to a point that he was often overruled by his other brother Scabrus. After Immortan Joe made a deal with Dementus and acquired a young Furiosa, Rictus was immediately taken by her. Given that he lacked any social skills and had an underdeveloped brain, Rictus thought Furiosa was a doll and was eventually obsessed with her to a point that he tried to touch her without her consent. This naturally made a young Furiosa super uncomfortable, causing her to run away from the biodome for her safety. Rictus ultimately died during the events of Fury Road, where he joined his father's war party to chase down Furiosa and Max, but only ended up losing his life when Nux crashed the war rig into a canyon. Corpus Colossus Immortan Joe's first and oldest son of Joe, Corpus Colossus was actually very intelligent, even if he was physically disabled and wheelchair-bound. He was basically the opposite of his dim-witted brother Rictus and was known to be a man stuck inside the body of a child. Although he was far more kind and good-natured than his horrible father, Corpus still shared some of his views. He believed that giving water to everyone who comes to the Citadel would eventually be seen as a sign of weakness, and that others might try to take control of the Citadel away from them. But please don't judge the book by its cover, because Corpus was Immortan Joe's second-in-command, and was seen ordering his brother Rictus around quite forcefully. 
Italy. Apparently, Corpus was born before the apocalypse had hit the world and Joe had done his best to look after him, by exhausting every resource at his disposal, which is probably why Corpus is covered in so many scars from all the medical procedures he was made to go through. His main job at the Citadel was to keep an eye on everyone with his telescope, but when Joe left to chase Furiosa with his war boys, he'd assigned the responsibility of the Citadel to Corpus. Well, nobody knows what happens to him after Furiosa takes over the Citadel, but by the look on his face at the end of Fury Road, I can assure you, he surely didn't return back to his old life of comfort. Prime Imperator As one of the high-ranking members of Joe's army, the Prime Imperator had a strong and muscular physique. Unlike the regular war boys who were usually painted in white pigment, he didn't have this paint on his body. However, his head was completely painted black and he also wore a belt buckle with the emblem of the cult of the V8 on it. In Fury Road, the Prime Imperator first makes his appearance at the Citadel, where he introduced Immortan Joe during a ceremony before Joe addressed the crowd of the wretched. Later on, he joined the chase to retrieve Immortan Joe's five wives and vowed to punish Furiosa for betraying Joe. During the confrontation, on the Giga Horse. He served as Furiosa's final opponent before she could reach Immortan Joe. Initially, he had the upper hand, but Nux threw him out of the running vehicle when he jammed the war rig onto it, causing the Imperator to fall off and be run over by the Giga Horse's wheels, only to get bloody crushed. Slit. Slit was one of the war boys sent by Immortan Joe to retrieve his harem of sex slaves after they fled with Imperator Furiosa. He tried to take control of the steering wheel in Nux's vehicle, but Nux headbutted him and regained control of the wheel. Later on, during Morsov's death or glory attack, Slit joined in by targeting the same vehicle and shouted, Mediocre, in response to Morsov's attempt. Now, I really don't know whether this was meant to spoil their moment of glory or if it was just friendly banter among comrades who believed they'd be meeting in Valhalla. Given Slit's typical behavior, the former seems more probable. Despite this, Morsov still succeeded in sacrificing himself and achieving a so-called historic death. During the chase back to the Citadel, Slit jumped into Max's stolen interceptor, which he called Razor Cola. While the war rig was returning back to the Citadel, in the chaos of the chase, Slit's car gets trapped between the war rig and the People Eater's limousine. Realizing the inevitable, Slit accepted his impending death by shouting Valhalla as his vehicle exploded. Coma Doof Warrior. While I know this war boy isn't of much importance in the films, I just had to include him in the list because of how iconic his character design is. And not just that, George Miller even gave him a quirky backstory, which I think is well deserved for a musician rocking and rolling through the backgrounds of iconic fight scenes in Fury Road. So, the Coma Doof Warrior is characterized by his lack of eyeballs, pale complexion, and poor dental condition. All Miller villains do have eccentric fashion choices, so similarly, Coma wore a skull-shaped mask, a red bodysuit with one shoe on his left foot and part of the bodysuit torn on on the right side. As a kid, Coma was apparently a blind musician who lived happily with his mother, who was also a musician and taught her son to survive on the comfort of music. Unfortunately, they were attacked, and Coma's mother was taken away, and later someone delivered a head to him. It was Immortan Joe who discovered Coma with his mother's head and brought him under his wing. Through the film, Coma is often seen playing a fire-spitting guitar while hanging on the Doof Wagon, a vehicle that was equipped with massive speakers alongside the War Boys. During the battle with Immortan Joe, when Max Rokotansky confronts him, Coma was thrown off the Doof Wagon and met his End. Well, let's just say he died doing what he loved. I want them back. Furiosa, a Mad Max Saga, 2024. Now, now, I've already mentioned before that the prequel film indeed retained a lot of recurring villains. Given that I've already covered them in the previous films, I'd like to save your time and mine by only focusing on the new bad guys introduced in Furiosa. So, don't come at me, and let's begin with. Why? Dr. Dementus. If you've watched Furiosa, you already know Dementus is the main bad guy of the new Mad Max film. Dementus, the leader of the Biker Horde, becomes a powerful warlord in the wasteland, but before that, Furiosa's story begins with him. She's taken by his men from her home at the Green Place as proof that a place of abundance indeed exists. Dementus's cynicism and dark humor is the highlight of his character. He ruled the Biker Horde with an iron fist and actually believed himself to be some sort of a great almighty. To further support that, he even rode on a chariot made out of three motorcycles. Dementus is loud bold and morally bankrupt, often blaming the wasteland lifestyle for his tyranny and talking about how he had to rise up even though he lost his kids to the fall. But despite his flaws, Dementus is quite charming and good at hiding his true self. He's a bit like a mix of Lord Humongous and Max Rokotansky, with a wild streak of immaturity that sometimes makes him seem like a stubborn child throwing a tantrum while also being dangerously violent. Dementus was seen always vying for power, which is why, when he gets hold of Furiosa's mother, he tortures Mary Jabasa to spill the truth about the Green Place. And when she refuses to comply, he 
he brutally kills her off as Furiosa watches. This exact moment is what makes him the subject of Furiosa's rage and the direction of revenge for the future. Later, when Dementus comes across a battered war boy, he reaches the Citadel and blatantly asks Immortan Joe to step down, which of course fails spectacularly. Later, as his crew storms Gas Town, setting it up as a ticking bomb, Dementus braves into Citadel's heart and blackmails Joe till he gives him the leadership of Gas Town, in exchange for Furiosa and his organic mechanic. But of course, this piece doesn't last very long. As years pass by, Dementus finds himself growing super unhappy about the crisis at Gas Town. His biker horde has finally begun revolting, especially because of the shortage of food and water. Dementus feels like he got a raw deal and puts the blame on Immortan Joe and the other big shots. So, he decides to take matters into his own hands and grabs control of the bullet farm. He was also very delusional because he didn't stop there. Dementus wanted the Citadel too. Well, if you've seen the film, you already know how things go haywire and his actions lead to what the history men call the 40-day wasteland war. This super brutal conflict ended up wiping out most of Dementus's biker horde, leaving him nowhere to go but run. Appropriately enough, Dementus doesn't escape fate this time because Furiosa gets to him and exacts her revenge by capturing and imprisoning him as a living fertilizer for a peach tree. Scabra Scrotus. During the events of Furiosa at the Citadel, Scrotus was present with his father, Immortan Joe, his brother Rictus, and other leaders of the cult of the V8 when Dementus, the leader of the Biker Horde, forced a negotiation on them by threatening to blow up Gas Town. Scrotus was absolutely furious when Joe agreed to a mere modest yet still generous deal with Dementus that allowed the leader of the Biker Gang to become the new Lord Protector of Gas Town. Despite his anger, Scrotus didn't challenge his father's decisions. Eventually, as Dementus' poor management of Gas Town began causing problems for their empire, Scrotus demanded that they go to war against Dementus. Immortan Joe, however, decided to wait and bide his time. Later, when Furiosa returned after a near-death encounter with Dementus, she informed Joe's war council about how Dementus was faking a disaster at Gastown to lure the Citadel's forces away and leave it undefended for him to capture. Scrotus was among those who dismissed her claims and went on to insist on a direct battle with Dementus. However, Joe believed Furiosa and adjusted their strategy. So, instead of charging toward Gastown, they faked an attack while positioning themselves to fight Dementus from a place of strength. During the 40-day Wasteland War, Scrotus served as one of Immortan Joe's frontline commanders. Despite his impatience and lack of tactical finesse, he proved to be quite the capable warrior and leader in open combat. The Octoboss. As the name implies, the Octoboss was an underboss under Dementus and was indeed his right-hand man. He led a small faction of dangerous bikers called the Mortifiers, who later came to be known as Motiflyers as they rode flying bikes. The Octoboss was deeply influenced by the stories of flying machines and all the past events narrated by the History Man. That was exactly what motivated him to acquire his dream of conquering the skies once more. And I think his motorbike was one of the best vehicles in Furiosa, as it featured a ginormous fan mounted at its back. I think the Octoboss wanted to seem like the harbinger of doom because he wore a rather demon-esque helmet that had huge protruding horns and it didn't just help shielding his face from the harsh weather of the wasteland, but also served him well to intimidate his opponents. When Furiosa's mother fails to rescue her, she gets caught by Dementus' biker horde. It was actually the Octoboss who tortured Mary Jabasa to death while young Furiosa watched. Later, after Dementus decides on seizing Gas Town, Octoboss helps him lead his biker horde to launch an attack on the fuel tanker. After they take over the tanker, Dementus picks a random horde member and slathers him in white mud. Although the random biker dude hates being ordered around, Around, Octoboss makes him obey. Octoboss also helps others to disguise themselves into war boys so they can put on a fake show for later. Eventually, Dementus, the Octoboss, and the remaining biker horde pretend to chase the tanker being protected by fake war boys. But the guards of Gastown aren't sure what's happening and calls up Immortan Joe's brother, who was then the guardian of Gastown. Somehow they're not convinced and begin suspecting that it is indeed a ruse, so he orders the men to keep the gates closed. Dementus was quick to pick up the sense of doubt and to make the charade seem more real. He ordered his hordes to genuinely attack the tanker. And well, this of course kills all the fake war boys, thus shocking the Octobus, who calls Dementus a scum. Even though the ruse worked and they managed to get into Gas Town by using the tanker as their Trojan horse, this incident sliced a permanent rift between Dementus and the Octobus. As time passed, we find out that Octobus and his small faction of men went rogue after revolting against Dementus. Later, we see Octobus and his men attacking the war rig while it was being driven by Praetorian Jack. He led a swarm of motorcycles that had parachute rigs, allowing them to attack from the sky. Jack called them the Moto Flyers. Well, let's just say this assault was very effective as they wiped out almost everyone aboard the war rig, leaving only Jack and Furiosa alive. I remember that the Octoboss was one of the last guys to try to get to the rig. He was flying on a long black parachute with many tails that looked like an octopus. Sadly, he was killed by a rotor called the Bomby Knocker, as it was attached to four swinging maces. And my friends, that's how Octoboss and his small faction of deadly fashionable bikers were wiped out. So, that was all the prominent villains I could think of from the Mad Max franchise. While you can surely draw parallels from most old and new villains of the franchise, each of them 
them are driven by their own animalistic instincts. Not just that, according to the vaguely bifurcated timelines of the franchise, we also get to see how, as time passes and the hopelessness of this universe deepens, the villains become equally tyrannical. The last semblance of humanity in their totalitarianism is barely existent, as you can easily figure out through Morton Joe and his empire. With that being said, who's your favourite secondary villain from this list? Let us know in the comment box below. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.